So let me start off by talking about a framework that we've developed working in conjunction with America Makes and our business incubator in Youngstown. This framework allows a business to look at their product portfolio and determine what products make sense to uh, manufacture using 3D printing or how to optimize their products using 3D printing. And so we can describe a manufactured product in, in three ways. We can, just, we can look at its complexity and so in our model we've quantified the level of complexity. We can look at a product's customization and so we've developed a scale for customization. And then of course there's the question of how many parts you're going to produce. So those three attributes. Um, in, in traditional manufacturing, we minimize complexity and customization in order to minimize the cost per part um, because of tooling and et cetera. Uh, on the other hand, with 3D printing, it doesn't really matter whether it's a part is simple or something that's been made more complex in order to make it lightweight or more functional. It doesn't really matter whether the part is not customized or whether it's something highly customizable. Really the cost to print is basically the same. So Hugh talked about complexity being free, but arguably so is customization as well. And so those are the attributes that we want to focus on. So what are the challenges that are involved in that? Okay, so Hugh addressed first of all complexity. And we, we need to move from our methods and our tools for design for cost, we need to move to design for functionality and aesthetics. And so that brings us into topological optimization, but also as you're going to see from our panel here, we need to think about design for multi-materials and design for multi-functionality in our 3D printed structures. Let's talk about customization here shortly. Think about uh, consumer products. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have basically removed the consumer from the design and functionality of the products that they're going to purchase. They play really no role in that because of I mean, how much cost are you going to put in the tooling to be able to have customers uh, make a customized product. Uh, but let's look at consumer electronics. If I take somebody's smartphone or their tablet and I look at the content in that device, well, that, that person has actually customized it. It's unique to them. And so we have a generation of people that have been doing active virtual customization that I believe are primed for physical customization. Production volume, maybe I'll save this for later during the discussion, but uh, what I do want to say is for those like 3D systems here who are machine manufacturers, we need to look at ways to be able to make parts faster, not just having 100 machines to make 20 million parts, but to do things faster. And then lastly, the manufacturing ecosystem. Don't put the new wine of 3D printing into the old wineskin of the manufacturing ecosystems that we've done traditionally. We have to think differently. We have to think differently when we relate to the consumer and the customer. We have to think differently about our supply chain. We have to think differently about whether we're going to buy a 3D printing machine ourselves or whether we're going to get access equipment from other sources and where we're going to put the equipment. So, if we're going to optimize complexity and customization, we've got to think about a different manufacturing ecosystem. So really what I'd like to talk about is two, two aspects of additive manufacturing. One is the set of enabling technology that is made possible. And some of this was addressed earlier, but really what we're talking about is tool-less on-demand manufacturing. So Additive manufacturing technologies that are truly disruptive will eliminate many sets of tools and many steps and that is what industry is going to, to, to really move forward and adopt. Parts can be stored in software, we saw that earlier, downloaded and printed at point of use, but let's not forget that there are still going to be additional processing steps that are going to be required to produce the final parts. But nevertheless, parts can be stored in the cloud, they can be downloaded and, and therefore produced. Finally, I think in terms of supply chain optimization, there's a, there's a big uh, possible supply chain disruption in that uh, parts, work in progress that was shipped from place to place can now all be done in the same location and that's going to lead to new supply chains, new types of feedstock materials that are going to have to be produced in order to feed the machines, the additive manufacturing machines that use unique kinds of feedstock materials. The, another major enabling technology, and this was also alluded to earlier, is the ability to produce advanced designs with previously unattainable performance. Now this can lead to physical or chemical performance or even multifunctionality, and that's what's going to be enabled if we have truly production grade additive manufacturing technologies available in the future. I'm going to address three critical challenges in terms of really uh, in industry adoption. 
we need to have material properties that are as good or better than what is conventionally produced. If that's not possible, industry is not going to adopt these technologies. We need significant increases in throughput, in feature resolution, and surface finish. 10 to 100x better than what's, a, what's possible today. And for that, we need major investments, and, and the, the cost of the equipment is going to be significantly higher. When I make the, I make the, uh, the comparison between a desktop 3D printer versus a semiconductor lithography tool, the kinds of smarts that we find in clean room tools, those are the kinds of smarts that are going to have to be the technologies. Those are going to have to be embedded in these machines if they're going to be truly adopted for production. Finally, we need production equipment that is, has some self-diagnostics. Because we, we, we talk about the great possibilities of 3D printing, being able to make a part of arbitrary complexity, but we forget that in, being, in building a part that's made up of thousands of layers, every layer gives you the opportunity to introduce a defect in the part. So we need inspect as you build and repair on the fly capability for these machines to produce certified parts that are going to go into uh, functional machinery. Uh, I want to talk about something that's a little bit different. Uh, you've seen a lot of uh, what was in the keynote this morning and what we've been talking about thus far is talking about just um, basically what you can do with additive manufacturing. And, and what we've been doing at, at Lawrence Livermore is been looking at what sort of new physics and new material property spaces can we go after by developing our own additive manufacturing methods. The reason we need to develop new additive manufacturing methods is that really the stuff that's out there just can't do and control structures and materials that we want at the scale that we're, we're interested in. So if you look at the upper left there, you can see an example of an octet truss. That's a structure made, in this case, down at the micron scale. Um, that material is, but from its name, it's a truss-like. Every member within it is in pure tension or compression. And that material can be ultra light, have much higher performance compared to um, a traditional material made with typical bend dominating, especially when you look at porous materials, natural materials. We've made that same structure, ultra light, in the material that looks transparent there. And that material has actually been coated with atomic layer deposition of alumina at 40 nanometers thick. Then we remove the polymer. Now we have an ultra light material that still maintains the huge mechanical advantage in, in structure and properties. So that's an example of mechanical advantage. You can actually think of tailoring the structure throughout a component. Um, but what we're thinking of here is what other physics can we address? On the lower left, you can see the example of a structure that actually has controlled, and in this case, even negative uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. By combining two different materials plus void space, as you heat up the structure, one of the materials acts as an actuator to drive the entire structure to shrink. So the sorts of physics that you can get at really enable you know, new design ideas. You imagine the complexity of teaching a designer to think in just the terms of additive manufacturing of, you know, a single material and what new tools have advantage. What if you could actually tailor the material properties throughout? Um, we also are using these tools to investigate physics. So in the upper right, you can see an example of a thermite reacting. This thermite, it's a metal, uh, uh, metal fuel and an oxidizer that are mixed together at the nanoscale. But instead of just mixing up the nanoscale and looking at the reactivity, we're actually structuring the material down and controlling its microscale structure in, or, in understanding how the nanoscale and microscale structures of these materials interact together to drive the performance of the material. And just something for this audience that I threw in at the last minute, you can see at the lower right, interconnects, electric interconnects that are printed from one Z height to another in free space, in this case with silver, and without any support structure and at low temperature, so you don't have to worry about damaging electronics. It opens up a material set that you couldn't do before because of the high temperature for interconnects. So Thank printing you. is uh, ubiquitous, but you might remember it, it wasn't always like that. Um, today, we can print a letter, we can print a high quality photograph with just the press of a button. And with the emergence of 3D printing, now it's becoming possible to do the same with mechanical objects, so uh, print them with pretty much with the same ease as we used to print a document. Uh, we think we need to be a lot more ambitious and uh, think about printing how we print functionality and intelligent objects. And this is actually quite possible today. It's, uh, um, uh, with the use of novel materials, organic or nanomaterials, we can print uh, transistors, circuits, uh, sensors, even displays or batteries. Um, and so today, for example, we can print uh, an organic circuit with about a thousand transistors on this plastic sheet. And uh, 
novel materials, advanced materials, can be engineered to behave as a semiconductor, as a um, sensor for an analyte, um, or a, a, a device that emit, emits light. And, and that's a really interesting opportunity. And it's amazing because we can start thinking about using these materials, printing the Internet of Things. It's no longer just simply uh, objects, mechanical objects, but things that have uh, some degree of intelligence. And if additive manufacturing is really the, the new way to make things, then it should be able to give us high-level, complex functionalities. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an incredible and, and really disruptive innovation opportunity for material science and for people who, uh, for chemical companies, to create entirely new classes of materials with high uh, value. It's a disruptive innovation opportunity for those who are in the business of print who, or, or thinking about participating in new value chains in, in manufacturing. And it's also a, a disruptive innovation opportunity for people who dream of creating entirely new kind of objects with very high levels of complexity. So we, uh, as we get together new types of materials and new process technologies, and we start combining them, uh, getting into new degrees of uh, functionalities integrated together, it leads us to uh, take, adding, adding to these objects not just electronic functionality, which, which we talked about, but also optical or, or microfluidic functionality. And, enables us to think about these objects and the crea their creation at an entirely new level of integration. And so we put that functionality where it really belongs. No longer just think, think of electronics, every single electronics device that we have is, is some electronics board that we put in a box. And now we can start thinking about putting that functionality exactly where it should be detached or, or freed from, from that box. And we think that that level of integration will lead to a similar kind of revolution that integrated circuits gave us a few decades ago.